raindrops on roses and whiskers on kittens, bright copper kettles and warm woolen mittens, brown paper packages tied up with strings. These are a few of my favorite things. It feels like a fresh breeze every time you see it. It's about joy, I think, ultimately, and I think everybody senses it. It is those beautiful cumulus clouds. It is the ravishing beauty of the mountains. It is the gorgeous sound of the music. It is um, the delight of the children. As I understand it, the sound of music has become the most watched musical film in history. Even today, it just thrills audiences around the world and in many different languages. I don't think any of us who were involved in its creation could have ever anticipated its remarkable success. Whenever I browse through this script, it brings back so many wonderful memories and funny ones. I guess you could say that nearly everything in here is one of my favorite things. Raindrops on roses and whiskers on kittens, bright copper kettles and warm woolen mittens, brown paper packages tied up with strings. These are a few of my favorite things. One of the more remarkable things that happened on the movie was meeting the real Maria von Trapp. There was Julie Maria, and it was really Maria that it was about, not Julie. She, you know, came onto the set, and like everybody was wondering who this woman is in this babushka. Lo and behold, she suddenly was there in Salzburg in Austria. I hadn't expected it, and I was really nervous. Would she think I was appropriate? What would she really be like? And she was obviously a very strong woman. I guess you'd have to be to endure what she endured. She had accomplished a great deal in her life, and um, I had heard that she really wanted to direct the film, too, but it just didn't work out that way. My mother never quite accepted that she had sold the rights and that that meant they could do whatever they wanted with the story. and. It had to be a strange experience for her to be observing a filming of her own story. And my mother was used to controlling things, so she tried to uh, influence the, the progress of the film and the way characters were being uh, developed. And she tried very hard to see that my father was portrayed in a more gentle, kinder fashion than he had been on the Broadway stage. She was a real ho, 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 bundle of great fun and great humor. She said, oh, you are even more handsome than my husband. Oh, yes, oh, yes. So that's about the, the, the most devastating note I got from her. So we, we got on like a house on fire. In fact, she was getting almost too much. I said, please get this, the gushing baroness off the set if you possibly can. She was a kind of bossy. She was a kind of run things, you know? and. Uh, I'm the, I'm the director of the things, so I didn't like that about her. My mother was a very complex person. She had had an unhappy childhood. The scars of that childhood were always there, and insecurities plagued her all her life. She was a, a postulant in the Abbey in Nonberg and uh, was not fitting in very well. She was absolutely, totally unsuited for a contemplative religious life in a convent. And I suspect that the nuns were very happy when uh, the opening at uh, my father's house came up and, and she went. Uh, she, she must have been a very disruptive person in the 
tranquil life of the convent. I tried to create my own energy for the character, and I know that it, it occurred to me that any woman, no matter how splendid or how um, vital, would be simply daunted by seven children. <laughs> and so I tried to convey that at times, just you know, a little bit, it could be exhausting or it uh, could be extremely uh, daunting, to say the least. Captain with seven children, what's so fearsome about that? Oh, I must stop these doubts, all these worries. We were actually filming I Have Confidence, and part of that song was in the residence plats in Salzburg, and Maria von Trapp walks across in the background. My mother, my sister Rosemary, and my niece Barbara walk across the back of the screen in a street scene of Salzburg in the film. She's in a shot way in the background. I only I would, as a director, would, would, would recognize her. She's going across the background of a shot. I have confidence in confidence alone. I really liked the film tremendously. We had a perfectly comfortable villa. There were a lot of rooms, and it was a, a big house with a lot of servants and a big garden. In the film, of course, we're in a palace, not just a, a comfortable mansion. So that was a little over the top. There are some details in the film that are true to life. For example, the bosun's whistle. My father did use it, and it was very effective but they didn't show up marching formally the way in the film. They, they just responded to their signal. The time period was greatly condensed. My father and mother were actually married in 1927, and we left Austria in 1938. There were three things that happened at the same time in 1938. First, my father was offered a commission in the German Navy. He had been a submarine commander in the First World War. And the thought of having a modern submarine under his command was very attractive to him, and, and uh, he, he really, really was interested in this, but he, he just felt he couldn't do it. Secondly, the family, which had been singing for about two years professionally, was invited to sing at uh, Hitler's birthday celebration and the family chose to say no. And then lastly, my brother Rupert, who had just finished medical school, was offered a fairly advanced position in a hospital, but he didn't like what he heard was going on due to so many Jewish physicians having disappeared. And after saying no to all three of these, there was no choice but to leave Austria. We did not walk over the mountain into Switzerland. We lived in Salzburg, and if you walk over the mountain from Salzburg, you're in Berchtesgaden in Germany, which is where Hitler's mountain retreat was, uh, not where we wanted to go. When we left the house, the key was dropped off with a local religious order, which occupied it for a few weeks, and then Heinrich Himmler who was one of the, the worst of the top guys in the Nazi regime, took it over as his headquarters. His office uh, on the second floor, which he had completely soundproofed, and uh, in the garden he had bomb shelters built, and there were plans for a special subway from the house to the railroad station so that when Hitler visited, he could do it underground without being seen. And he visited uh, Heinrich Himmler many times at uh, our old house. The Sound of Music, the film, is based, of course, upon the wonderful Broadway musical by Rodgers and Hammerstein. But what a lot of people don't know is that that 
musical was based on a German movie about the Von Trapp family, and that German movie was taken from Maria Von Trapp's actual biography that she wrote. So it's got quite a history. Rodgers and Hammerstein were attracted to stories that both had human aspects to them, but also had some grit. And I think the fact that the true life story of the Von Trapps involved escaping from Salzburg and all kinds of political underscoring really fascinated them. They were never afraid of a story that had some real problems and some real guts to them. Obviously, one of the things that attracted me to this wonderful movie was Rogers and Hammerstein themselves. They're not only beloved by me, they're, they're loved throughout the world for their wonderful music. I think the first meeting that I recall with Rogers and Hammerstein was when I auditioned for a show that they wrote called Pipe Dream. And uh, it was very, very early on in my career. And I remember the audition was just me. It wasn't with a mass of other people. And uh, it was held in a theater on Broadway some sort of late morning, early afternoon. And I knew he was sitting out in the dark, dark audience. Um, and I belted out some semi-operatic song. I think it was the waltz song from Tom Jones or something like that, and gave it my all. Rogers came up on stage afterwards and he looked at me and he said, that was absolutely adequate. <laughs> and uh, I went, oh, no, he said, no, no, I'm just teasing you, it was lovely. And uh, he said, have you been auditioning for anything else? And I said, well, yes, as a matter of fact, I have. I've been um, singing for Alan J. Lerner and Frederick Lowe, who are thinking of making this musical about George Bernard Shaw's Pygmalion. And he looked at me for a very long time, and then he said, oh, he said, I tell you what, if they ask you to do that show, I think you should. But if you don't do that show, I wish you would let us know because we would very much like to use you. And I think it was the most generous piece of advice I could have been given. And of course, I did do my fair lady. But subsequently, I worked for Rogers and Hammerstein because they created Cinderella for me. Julie Andrews, of course, made the right choice in taking My Fair Lady over Pipe Dream. It was lucky for Cinderella and for Rogers and Hammerstein that she made that choice. Cinderella was a major, major television event. 90-minute live, original production for television. And as you know, any story of Cinderella goes many, many places. So the various locales they had to squeeze into one studio makes it even more remarkable. Have a good time. And in a way, Cinderella proved to be the greatest screen test for the sound of music ever. Do I want you to who knew whether it ever occurred to anybody at the time, but certainly when you look at her doing Cinderella, you realize, oh, I can see the beginnings of Maria von Trapp in that performance. That production of Cinderella passed rather like a dream for me because everything was coming at me so fast and so furiously. But the actual production was seen by, I think, 107 million people that night. And I think that was the largest audience to date that had ever tuned in for a television show. And my love for Oscar was heightened when one day I was standing in the wings and for some reason, I, I, I whistle when I get nervous, and I was whistling a song, the, 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 re, the refrain of The Last Time I Saw Paris. And I never thought anything about it. I, I thought I was all alone. I was just sort of standing in the wings waiting to go on. And a voice behind me said, I meant every word of that, you know, when I wrote it. And I turned around and there was Oscar Hammerstein. And I said, ah, oh, Mr. Hammerstein, I said, I'm so sorry. I had no idea that you had written that song. And he said, yes, it was, uh, my memory was of just before the war. And when I went back after the war, 
I was so devastated at what I saw had happened to Paris and I felt compelled to write the song, to, to write those lyrics. It's always been one of my favorite songs and uh, it was so lovely that he shared that with me. He was grave and quiet, had a wonderful sort of pockmarked face and very tall, a terribly nice man and um, I think it's obvious from all his beautiful lyrics. We think of Julie Andrews and the Sound of Music almost at the same time, but it was Mary Martin and Howard Lindsay and Russell Krauss who brought the idea of the story of Maria von Trapp to them. Howard Lindsay and Russell Krauss had been working together for years in the theater, and they saw this German film about the Trapp family and thought it was a great story, loved it, and thought, it would make a great musical, but they expected it would use the music that the Von Trapp sang. Rodgers and Hammerstein thought the idea of Maria Von Trapp was a good enough idea for an entire musical, and they begged Lindsay and Krauss and Mary Martin to wait while they finished Flower Drum Song so they could then dive in and write what we now know as The Sound of Music. The hills are alive with the sound of music. When the musical was being developed with Mary Martin in the starring role, Mary Martin actually came up and spent two weeks here um, getting to know my mother. They were very much kindred spirits and got along extremely well. The interesting thing was that Mary Martin had asked me to play Captain Von Trapp. I think Mary was getting on in those days, and I think she was losing her marbles slightly because she didn't realize how young I was. I was only 25 years old, but she thought because I played character parts, I could disguise myself and be older than I really was. But that was stretching it a bit. I met her and I met Rogers and I already had known Oscar Hammerstein, whom I was very fond of. I went up to their apartment and I could see them all kind of just being very polite <laughs> and, and dealing with Mary in the gentlest possible way. In almost all the Rogers and Hammerstein musicals, Oscar Hammerstein wrote the libretto. Um, in the case of The Sound of Music, since the project was brought to them by Lindsay and Krauss, uh, Hammerstein stepped back. He also was not a well man at that point, so I think he figured writing the lyrics would occupy enough of his time. People think of Dick Rogers and Oscar Hammerstein whenever they think of The Sound of Music and it stops there. As a matter of fact, the story of a musical is very important, and that was written by Howard Lindsay and Russell Krauss. I knew Howard Lindsay because he'd played the king in Cinderella, the prince's father. And he and his wife, Dorothy Stickney, were terribly kind to me. They were the most adorable couple Howard and Dorothy, I knew very, very well. The stage play began in 1959 and was a huge success on Broadway. Of course, it was ripe for being spoofed. We are the happy Swiss family press. We bring you a happy song that I used to sing when I was a happy nun back home in Switzerland. I had no idea then that I would be in the movie of The Sound of Music. And of course, we did this tremendous spoof of the Pratt family. Puddings and starches and dancing like them. <laughs> and we had such fun, we thought we were being so clever. And of course, it's come back to haunt me since many, many times. But we did have fun doing it. The Sound of Music was Oscar Hammerstein's last show. Interestingly, the very last song he ever wrote was Edelweiss. Edelweiss is not remotely an authentic Austrian folk song. In the great tradition of musical theater, it is a song written by Rodgers and Hammerstein for The Sound of Music, and in fact was the last song that Rodgers and Hammerstein ever wrote. Um, it was perfect for the moment in the show, and therefore it comes across as an Austrian folk song. That's what certainly it was meant to be. 
But uh, when the Reagan White House played it as the entree to the Austrian ambassador, it really showed you that uh, a lot of people in the world do confuse it with the real thing. Probably one of my favorite songs of all time is Edelweiss. I've said before how um, songs like Oh, What a Beautiful Morning by Rodgers and Hammerstein or Edelweiss are simply classic little phrases of music. They, they turn about on themselves and come back to the original theme. But they're so simple and the words match the notes so beautifully that in fact they become timeless. The Sound of Music was the last musical that Rodgers and Hammerstein wrote. I think Hammerstein knew that he was dying when he was writing The Sound of Music, and songs like Edelweiss uh, were really the legacy that he left us. They were his benediction, if you will. That particular song probably meant more to him than most. Small and wide, clean and bright, and bright you look I suddenly realized that the song is not just traditional to Austria. It's really a song about anyone's homeland, that you can translate that lyric and uh, apply it to any country that you're passionate about, that you feel passionate about, any homeland that you care for. I wish, in fact, that it had been my song to sing. I have subsequently sung it, but uh, I've always had a great fondness for it. Bless my homeland forever. What I think makes Rogers a complete genius is that he wrote in a very, very constricted dubber of notes. He often would almost be within an octave. But if you take something like De Re Mi, it's basically all within an octave. And the simplicity of the thing is deceiving because, I mean, all. I mean. So far, so good. Uh, but now it's the way he changes it. I mean, that's the clever thing. And it's all within, a, all basically within an octave. No, 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 actually, it isn't because, it, it, no, it is. It's all within an octave. Even though Oscar Hammerstein died shortly after the show opened on Broadway, the movie needed two new songs, and the producers of the movie went to Richard Rogers to write both the music and the lyrics for Something Good and the wonderful traveling song, I Have Confidence. What is perhaps unique in this situation was in Saul Chaplin, the movie had an associate producer who was himself a composer, he really guided Richard Rogers into exactly the kind of song that the filmmakers knew would help get Maria from the Abbey to the Von Trapp mansion. Everything will turn out fine. I have confidence the world can all be mine. They'll have to agree I have confidence in me. In the case of I have confidence, there was one extra. Um, I wouldn't call it a hazard. It became something very interesting for me to work on. I have confidence in sunshine. To be really honest with you, I think it's one of the few lyrics that I've had a lot of trouble with. I rarely do, and lyrics matter so much to me. I have confidence in me. Things like strength doesn't lie in numbers, strength doesn't lie in wealth, strength lies in nights of peaceful slumbers. Strength lies in nights of peaceful slumbers when you wake up. Wake and I kept thinking, what has a night of peaceful slumber got to do with strength other than that you might feel better in the morning from having had a peaceful slumber? But to convey all that in a very short spell of time was difficult. So I finally decided that the best way to sing the song so that the lyric just rattled itself off my tongue and into the, into the film was um, to pretend that I was so nervous about going to the Von Trapp Villa for my new job that the best way to sing it would be to go quite 
dotty for a while. All I trust I leave my heart to. All I that's why I do all the swinging of the guitar, and that's why I trip at the end. I do anything I can to sort of distract from having to think about the lyric too much, and all I tried to do was make myself seem so nervous that I was babbling, really. And uh, I, in a way, it really seemed to help the song. Many of the Rodgers and Hammerstein musicals had been translated to film. Oh, what a beautiful morning. Oh, what a beautiful day. Carousel was a lovely movie. And also South Pacific. I gather you regard this as a good omen. Yes. King and I was gorgeous and, and superb, and I loved it. Everything going well with us. But I think, actually, that The Sound of Music was the most successful adaptation to film from stage. All the changes that were made, of which there are hundreds, hundreds of changes in the dialogue and the positioning and all kinds of things, all made a brilliant stage show into a brilliant movie. And what is extraordinary is that they each exist in a way completely separately with a lot of familiar territory covered. But they are different things and they're both successful. The hills are alive with the sound of music, with songs they have sung for a thousand years. I think it actually transcended the original production to some extent. And one of the reasons for it, I think, was to suddenly have like a 70-piece symphony orchestra playing behind you and to have those glorious mountains and to have all the lovely themes of nature. My heart wants to beat like the wings of the birds that rise from the lake to the trees. Somehow it all suddenly came together. And I do know that singing those songs, you couldn't help but be lifted a little bit. Even in the recording booth, you couldn't help but imagine, simply because the sound was so thrilling and so uplifting and enormous with a huge orchestra behind you. There's, there's very little else that is as exciting as that. I go. One of the people most responsible for the success, uh, other than the music of, of The Sound of Music, is uh, Ernest Lehman, our wonderful writer. Lindsay and Krauss were so great at what they did, and Ernie Lehman had a lot to work with to begin with. What he did brilliantly was take the stage libretto, the book, and use many, many of the lines. If you compare them, almost all the lines of the stage show are there, but he changed the humor a lot. The stage play did have this tremendous reputation for being saccharine. And I know Chris Plummer and I were both worried that the, it would be so sugary, we would be you know, swimming through treacle to some extent. And he and I and Ernest Lehman, I believe, all tried to kind of tamp that down. I was a terrible bore in the very beginning of this movie because I'd grown up playing extraordinary great roles and suddenly to be handed the Captain Von Trapp was not exactly the greatest part ever written. And I was rather snobbish and rather badly behaved, but I did make my point that I wanted the character improved. And Ernie Lehman, who already was one of the most distinguished screenwriters in Hollywood, listened to my suggestion and he gave me some humor, some edge, some darkness, some irony, which the part had didn't have before he did, tackled it. He was enormous help. I, I just loved Ernie. Oh, no. Look. 
One of the outstanding things that uh, Ernest Lehman contributed was switching the Lonely Goat Herd with my favorite things. The Lonely Goat Herd used to be in the actual theater musical in the place where Maria cheers the children up in the thunderstorm. And Ernie thought that it would be so much better from the point of view of the lyrics and everything else to use my favorite things. What better way to cheer children up than to take their mind off uh, the storm outside and to talk about all the things that you love and that make you feel cozy and comfy. I think it was an inspired decision. Oh, when anything bothers me and I'm feeling unhappy, I just try and think of nice things. What kind what of things? Thing? Oh. They haven't sung Do Re Mi yet, which is the song where Maria sings with the children, in essence, teaches the children how to sing. So the children can't sing My Favorite Things because they haven't sung yet. So in fact, even though it appears to be a song by Maria and the kids, she's doing all the singing. And they interject lines about what their favorite things are. Again, a very, very clever change from the Broadway song position into a cinematic position equally strong very different. Because lyrics mean so much to me, I like to transition, if I can, from dialogue into song without really um, a great introduction or, or, or here comes the big number. You almost talk your way into a song, and Ernest Lehman made it part of the dialogue, part of the whole story, rather than breaking for a particular piece of music. And Favorite Things is a good example of that. Green meadows, skies full of stars, raindrops on roses and whiskers on kittens, bright copper kettles and warm woolen mittens, brown paper packages tied up with strings. These are a few of my favorite things. Ernest Lehman, who did the screenplay for the film Sound of Music, was so hands-on, came to our rehearsals, watched everything, and he loved everything, except he had a little bit of question mark about my favorite things, which was in the bedroom. Everything was staged, and it evolved into a pillow fight. This pillow went to that person, that person threw it to that person, that person threw it to that person. And we thought it looked fine. Ernie Lehman, our screenwriter, said, it's a little bit too planned. He said, it doesn't look spontaneous. So we lessened a little bit of the exactness and made it more freer. No school. Pillow fight. And it worked. Ernest Lehman. Using stage time and stage economy, do re mi, is the moment of Maria warming up to the kids. In the movie, you don't need that at that point. So Ernest Lehman conceived this notion that it would be later on, and in fact would be outdoors after my favorite things that they've sung together. And it becomes this extraordinary travelogue that was so carefully scripted and storyboarded in the movie. And it's one of the most incredible uses of location that I think has ever been used in any film. The other contribution that he made in Do Re Mi was that he used it to signify a passage of time. Now, children, Do Re Mi, past so and so on are only the tools we use to build a song. And by the end of the song, summer has passed. And it's a lovely way of saying what fun we had during the summer. So, Do La Fa Mi Do Re. What was really interesting is that long before we began filming, of course, Songs like Do, Re, Mi were planned meticulously by our wonderful choreographers, Mark Bro and Dee Dee Woods. Mark Bro and Dee Dee Wood were already great friends. We'd done Mary Poppins together. Mark and Saul Chaplin, co-producer, went to Salzburg ahead to time the length of the streets, the length of going here to there. And they were in the middle of uh, Salzburg, Austria, and Mark was dancing in and out of traffic, I don't know, and Solly ha had his little tape recorder of music. Can you believe that's how we did films? <laughs> and Mark is dancing in and out, and a policeman came up and spoke to them in German, I, I guess asking what they were doing, and they tried to explain, and then finally, I guess the policeman said, well, where are you from, you know, what, and they, Saul said, American, the policeman said, oh, and left, you know. 
the advance manager came back. He had taken pictures of all these beautiful locations. Then Ernest Lehman, Mark, myself, and our director, Bob Wise, sat down and designed the number. This section will go here. This section will go here. This section will go here. Then we rehearsed everything on the lot at 20th. When we got to Salzburg, we knew everything because we had two months of rehearsals before we started filming, which is a lot. I mean, nowadays, I don't think that happens. Even the bicycle scenes in Do Re Mi, we went outside the stage and rode bicycles up and down the little streets at 20th Century Fox lot to time that just right. The bicycles had to be rehearsed because if you notice, they're coming at the camera straight on and they're all, they had to pace themselves so that they would stay in this formation. On certain notes where two would sing, their bikes would come forward, the other bikes would go back and forward. You know, the kids, I don't know how they did it, but we rehearsed that and rehearsed that, and it turned out great. Do, a deer, a female deer, a drop of golden sun, me, a name I call myself, far. We were all over Salzburg. We were in the country, out of it, up in the mountains, down in the village, uh, running around fountains, running down great beautiful arbors, and, and uh, every single day we shot, there were many, many different takes in many different places. When you know the notes to sing. Filming that montage was probably, for me, the quintessential moment of the film. A doe, a deer, a female deer, That's what you can do in films. You can do so much of the lyrics here. You cut over here to another location. Over here is another location. That's the advantage of films, is you can do that. So when we had a chance to do that with Do Re Mi, it just worked wonderfully well. We evolved the children learning this song, which is completely different from do doing a stage play where you have the proscenium, and that's it, you do the song. This song was lengthened because we had these wonderful locations to shoot, chunks of it. I knew that at the end of the song that I would be climbing all those steps. Saul found these steps, and we said, OK, there are seven steps. Do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti. Oh, and then back to do again, which is eight. And I thought how fun it might be to, to go higher. As I'm, I, I just steadily climb the steps, it would be fun to go higher and higher and then higher. And so I asked if I could do the huge octave leap. And everybody said, go for it. And, and that's sort of how it came about. That would bring us The one that was my rock was directed Bob Wise. To see somebody that tremendous at work, to see the mind saying, this will be the montage and this is how we'll break it down, to see him do his homework was sensational. You realize why he became the great director he is. And I have to thank him for so much. My daughter, if you love this man, it doesn't mean you love God less. On the stage, Climb Every Mountain was sung just straight out to the audience. It was the big number. But in this case, it was more... You must go back. ...the Mother Abbess's advice to Maria and how important that was because Maria was going to have to go back and face her destiny with the Von Trapp family. And Bob used it so well. You have to live the life you were born to live. 
Peggy Wood starts that song with her back to camera. Climb every mountain, search high and low, follow every byway, every path you know. And that's rather unusual in film, if you think about it. I must say, when I first started filming that scene with Peggy and with Bob, I got terribly teary and I got, you know, a lot of uh, sparkle in the eyes because the song, again, is pretty, with that lovely uh, orchestra behind it. And it was a very moving moment for my character as Maria. Robert Wise, the last of the real gentleman directors in Hollywood. I mean, he really, he had a, he had a marvelous bedside manner for actors and for everybody. And he knew how to deal with that subject photographically. He kept it from being saccharine. He drove it forward. He, it was such a dangerous thing to do. I mean, it could have been laughed off the screen. Bob Wise taught me so many things about being still for film. If you're in close up with somebody and you're looking into their eyes, actually it's very hard to look into their plural eyes. You can really only look in one eye or the other eye or somewhere in the bridge of the nose because uh, your eyes constantly dart backwards and forwards. But when you're in huge screen close up, that can look very distracting. And Bob said, just fix on one spot and try not to blink too much. And it helped enormously. I'd had a private history with Julie, but I'd seen her, of course, in My Fair Lady, in which she was stunning. And by the time she hit The Sound of Music, all the sort of vaudevillian kind of training that she'd had as a dancer and singer had, had vanished. And uh, she was now a, 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 a very vulnerable, straight personality and a straight actress. She hadn't really acted in the sense of being an actress before. She was always in reviews or musical comedy. But now she was an actress, and The Sound of Music was the, the actual naked Julie Andrews on the screen. Her own heart you know her as, as I do. She's just, he's just exactly like that. And that's a trick on the screen. If you can do that on the screen, you're going to be a star. It was real. There was nothing musical comedy about it. I don't think she's probably ever done quite again what she did in that film. She seduced the world. Having Chris Plummer play Von Trapp was sensational. Uh, we've been very good friends ever since. They love you too he much. He really showed his marvelous strength and acting ability, and it made me try to rise to him, and he was very generous with me. When there's no one to I show think him. we both enjoyed the making of that scene. It was finally, we could really get our teeth around something other than the songs and other than the sort of sweetness and light of some of it and really get into some some heavy uh, emoting. <laughs> oh, please, Captain, love them, love them I all. I don't care to hear anything further from you I about my children. I am not finished yet, oh, Captain. Oh, yes, you are, Captain. Fräulein. The unsung stars of the film, I think, uh, was the weather. Uh, nobody told us when we went to Salzburg that it had the world's seventh highest annual rainfall. That particular summer, the rain was so ever-present that quite often it would begin to rain and Bob would say, it's not showing yet, it's not showing yet. It has to rain extremely hard for rain to show on film. 
and there's a moment on film when Maria peers through the gates of the front of the house when she's coming to meet the children and the captain for the very first time. And in fact, it was raining quite hard. Oh, help. It rained, it rained, it rained. And uh, I started getting calls from the studio saying, hey, you know, you're way over schedule and budget. You better, you better get out of there and get on home. And I, I promised, I said, if I don't get the, the necessary shot here by the end of this week, I'll fold up and come on home. But bye, guys. Just towards the end of the week, the weather cleared. It was nice. We got in and shot in a hurry and got out of there. And that's always difficult in location shooting, weather. Probably the most famous shot in the movie is when I sing the opening number in the hills near the Unterberg's mountain. <laughs> Ironically, it was, of course, the last thing we filmed in Salzburg. My coming across the fields at the beginning of the film is really the quintessential postcard picture. It looks and was absolutely lovely. What nobody knows is that it was a very difficult shot to get. I would start at one end of the field and a huge helicopter with a very brave cameraman hanging out the side of it would start at the other end of the field and he would swoop down through the trees and this helicopter would come at me sort of sideways, rather crab-like, and I would walk towards it. We'd get closer and closer to each other, and then I would make that big turn just before singing. The only thing is that <laughs> the downdraft from the helicopter engine uh, was so strong that every time he went around me to go back to the end of the field, he absolutely flattened me into the ground. And I tried so hard to sort of stand up and not be just leveled every time. I got angrier and angrier, and um, it was so stupid to keep biting the dust and spitting hay and grass and mud and things like that. So I finally tried to signal to the helicopter pilot, could he please make a wider turn around me? And all I got was this thumbs up and, you know, doing great, just keep it up. <laughs> the hills are alive with the sound of music. So when you see that shot in the film, I think you'd better just try to remember that. It turned out to be very serendipitous because instead of having simple cloudless skies and, and a pretty picture postcard backdrop, we've got these huge cumulus clouds that are lending such tension and drama to the scene. Working with children, I, I don't do very much of. I try to get it into my contract that no children are allowed, not even on screen or on the set, possible. Because they can either steal the scene just by standing there, which is so outrageous, or they can be a damn nuisance. And I mean, I totally agree with W.C. Fields and his whole attitude towards them. I, what, what is that great remark he made? Children are fine as, as, as long as they're cooked. The best thing is the children knew he didn't like them, and they didn't have to act. They didn't have to pretend that he didn't like them because he didn't like them. When he walked in that living room and started singing The Sound of Music with all the other children, I mean, some of them really started crying, and I don't think they were pretending. I think that it genuinely was felt, oh, he likes us, and it was, I think, those tears coming from the, you knew I wasn't crying. I was just pretending I was sad, <laughs> but not because I knew he liked me. <laughs> but I think that the children really were genuinely, you know, overwhelmed with, with this emotion. <laughs> Actually, I ended up liking this group very much. They were adorable in the, in the last analysis. Julie Andrews was wonderful with the children. She would tell them jokes and stories, and she taught them how to say supercalifragilisticexpialidocious backwards and forwards, and she kept their energy up on the set, and I thought it was remarkable. The pressure was on her because, you know, there were seven other people in most every scene that had to 
do well. And I think she felt that pressure knowing that she had to be good each time in case one of them messed up. It wasn't at the end of the montage of Do Re Mi that we shot the scene of the children coming home in the boat when the captain spots them having this wonderful time. And then came the moment that I had to fall in the water and the children had to fall in the water. Suddenly the assistant uh, director came up to me and said, could I just ask you something? He said, the little one can't swim. And would you be kind enough to uh, make sure that you grab her as quickly as possible? So be sure that you fall out of the front of the boat uh, because that's where she's going to be. And I said, oh, okay, I'll do my best. Now, th this poor child could be drowning, you know? Somebody said there were leeches in the water, but they didn't tell us that until afterwards. So it wasn't pretty water. We stopped filming, and the boat started really rocking because we all got very enthusiastic about it. And all of a sudden, it went one, two, three, and I went right over the back, and the last thing you saw were my legs and my feet. And all I could think of was, I simply have to get to little Gretel. And then Heather, who plays Louisa, finally got Gretel. And she picked up Gretel, and Gretel threw up on Heather. She must have gone under a couple of times, poor child. But I was very nervous about that. And of course, it wasn't the most pleasant thing to be swallowing water and, and going over the back of the boat. I think we did it twice in all. Um, and that, that was the take that worked the best, I believe, and that's the one that's in the movie. Much of the pre-production, the rehearsals of the songs and the dances, took place on the Fox lot under the guidance of our wonderful choreographers, Mark Bro and Dee Dee Wood. We worked with Julie Andrews on Mary Poppins before we did The Sound of Music. She is a perfectionist. She knew her music. She didn't even have to have anyone put a note on the piano. She had perfect pitch. She could tell the pianist what note she was going to sing. So working with her was so wonderful because she was a perfectionist. Let's do it again. You got it. Let's do it again. You got it. There's something wonderful about working with children that's kind of magical. Of course, it takes a little bit more time than working with naturally professional musicians and musical people. But suddenly, they will bring something new to your staging and your choreography. So that was wonderful to work with. And Charmian was just also a joy to work with because, you know, she says she's not a professional singer. She says she's not a professional dancer, a professional actress, but she was all three. I was 21, and the next oldest child was 13. Julie was 28. It was difficult pretending that I was 16. But I knew how to dance, and I could sing. <laughs> When we were filming 16 Going on 17, the day of filming, I had brand new shoes. And the wardrobe department forgot to put the special rubber coating on the bottom. And when we were doing the dance for the first take and I jumped up on the bench, I kept going through the plate glass. <laughs> and Robert Wise, I thought he was going to have a heart attack. His face just went white. But luckily, I only sprained my ankle. And I was not cut. And they came and they taped up my ankle. And in the older videos, if you look closely, you can see the bandage. But when they put the DVD out, they erased the bandage. So now nobody believes me when I tell them this story. When you have six children from ages five to 13, and you film for nine months. A lot happens to children in, in nine months. Nicholas Hammond, who played Friedrich, started out shorter than me. When we finished, he was six inches taller. I kept being raised with heels in my shoes. Then I was on apple boxes. And everywhere they could raise me, they did. But in scenes where they couldn't, where they were showing our whole body, I had to make sure that I was far enough away from him that they didn't see how tall he was. And then two of the little girls lost their teeth. I think everyone knows that the danger of working with children is, um, is 
Well, it's a pretty accurate uh, concern on most people's parts because they can walk away with a film. But uh, in this case, I have to say that the kids on The Sound of Music were a delight. And it is a testimony to how sweet and lovely they are that we have all stayed friends. And I remember each one of them for a different reason. I remember Charmian's uh, grace and her beauty. I remember her climbing over the windowsill and tiptoeing through the bedroom when I was Maria saying her prayers. Um, that image stays in my head. Nicholas, who played the eldest son, he was kind of shy and a little stiff and awkward, but somehow it became endearing, and you knew he was a boy just about to become a man. Heather had a wonderful sort of um, freckle-faced beauty, almost sandy hair, and uh, she too was rather shy. Dwayne, of course, I adored because he was just such a great face. You just wanted to push his chin and, and or pinch his cheeks. And that scene where he does come up from behind the bed and give me that grin, I'll always remember that. Angela Cartwright is such a beauty. You knew even then that she was special. And uh, she had a tremendous um, gentle composure. Little Debbie was losing her teeth and she had a sweet lisp. And uh, I always see her little face slightly upturned and she was always, uh, I, there was something about her. I just wanted to sort of hug her. And then of course there was Kim who was Gretel and she would come running onto the set. Um, she would be so heavy on the back of my bicycle, and I remember leaning in to the uh, strain of trying to catch up with the others in the great bicycle moment in, in, in Do Re Mi because of Gretel on the back. Um, but her sweetness, and she was always somehow at my side, hanging on to my thigh because she was that high at that time. Um, each one of them, I just have some special memory about them. The family von Trapp again to bid you farewell. There's a song in the film that I have not yet mentioned, and I think it provides a fitting finale for our program. Uh, let's see if I can remember the lyric. There's a sad sort of clanging from the clock in the hall, and the bells in the steeple, too. And up in the nursery, an absurd little bird is popping out to say, Cuckoo! Regretfully Cuckoo. they tell us, but firmly Cuckoo. they compel us to say goodbye to you. So long, farewell, our Peter say goodnight. We hate to go and miss this pretty sight. So long, farewell, our readers in adieu, 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 to you and you and you. So long, farewell, our readers and goodbye. We flit, we float, we flink, we flink, we fly. So long, farewell, our readers, and goodbye. The sun has gone to bed, and so must I. Goodbye.